Yeah.
The water, Rawat Kadash. The water, Kai. Thank you, Holy Spirit. All praises to Ahaya Kased. That's all praises to Anoki Said. That's all praises to the great I Am loving kindness. Bahashem Yeshaya. Bahashem Matza the Lamb. In the name of the Messiah, the Hamasiyak, Shalawam family. This is Little Son Sabal Nabaya. Like always, we are going to begin in Isaiah chapter 28, verses 9 and 10. That's Isaiah chapter 28, verses 9 and 10. It says, Whom shall he teach knowledge, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk, and drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. So family, we understand that we get our understanding via the Holy Spirit, via the precepts. Let's go to Psalm 119 and read verse 15. That's Psalm 119 verse 15. It says, I will meditate in thy precepts and have respect unto thy ways. Drop down to verse 104. Through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Now drop down to verse 159. Consider how I love thy precepts. Quicken me, O Lord, according to thy loving kindness. How many of you know that when you keep his precepts, that he will quicken you according to his loving kindness. And yes, if you look at that word for loving kindness in the Strong's, it is Kased, just like Anoki said. Now, family, take a look at this. This is a mulberry tree. Do you guys remember that nursery rhyme? All around the mulberry bush, the monkey chased the weasel? You know, it's funny that they chose a weasel. I don't know what a monkey feels. I don't know a monkey's righteous definition. But I can tell you that a weasel, a weasel feels temporality. Here today, gone tomorrow. With that said, let's talk a little bit about the mulberry tree. I'm going to a website called the abqjournal.com and it's talking about, it's asking the question why mulberry leaves drop leaves all at once because a mulberry tree does that. When the fall comes it's not a leaf here or a leaf there but it drops in big swatches. So it says, mulberries have a tendency to drop their leaves in one or a few episodes. This usually occurs after a frost has caused the leaves to form an abscission zone, a layer of cells to allow the leaves to cleanly separate from the twigs. So this is something that happens at a cellular level. It goes on to say that other trees may do this over a longer period. So this is how you know that the creative purpose of a mulberry tree is ingrained right into the tree itself. Now I'm not going to give away the definition just yet. We are going to talk about the definition of a mulberry tree, but not just yet. Later on, Later on in this lesson, we're going to bring that out. But right now, I just want you to understand that the mulberry drops all of its leaves at once. One day you're walking and it's full of leaves. The next day you're walking and where did the leaves go? Isn't that interesting? Let's see what else we can learn about a mulberry tree. This says that the weeping mulberry fruit is sweet and succulent. Look at that. So mulberries have sweet and succulent fruit. 
You know, I have never had mulberry fruit, but reading this makes me want to taste some. This comes from a website called gardeningknowhow.com. Let's go to another website and get a little bit more on the mulberry tree. This time the website we're going to is homeguides.sfgate.com. And this is what it says about mulberry trees. It says, mulberry trees tend to bleed at the cutting sites, which makes them vulnerable to stress and growth stunting. They bleed at the cutting sites. So in other words, when you go to prune a mulberry tree or to cut it somewhere, whether you're cutting off a branch or a twig or you're just cutting it straight at the trunk, it's going to bleed. The sap of that tree is going to be coming from those places where you cut. This is quite a fascinating tree. But enough talking about mulberry trees for now. I mean, this lesson is about alcohol, right? So let's go into the appendix section of the Book of Remembrance of First and Second Achi. And let's read the definition for the fallen watcher who is named Setuel. It's number 14, Setuel, Winter of God, Fermentation. It says Setuel is one of the one-tenth left to Semihaza by God when Noah prayed to destroy all the fallen watchers. He is the fourteenth from Semihaza. When he was first formed, God wanted him to have the definition that God can preserve and sustain you. He was made out of the feelings of being loved. When it is cold out and snow is gently building up on everything and all your sources of sustenance are asleep, you would not worry but feel like it was good to rest too. And if Setuel were his vision, you would be comforted in your well-being. He was the spirit of a father's love in winter that brings security. Setuel chose instead to have the definition that reality is not suitable to sustain you. So now he teaches insecurity. He causes little ones to have to go without sustenance and even without fathers and mothers. He teaches the making of strong drinks and drugs. He is the master of drunkenness. He is the destroyer of families. He is the enemy of intelligence and contentment. He is the destroyer of dignity. He is death and sorrow. He is the spirit of infidelity and promiscuity and of the utter degrad degradation of mankind. Setterwell is the enemy of marriages. So family, we have read this before. We have talked about Setterwell before. And most of us know someone who suffers from alcoholism and some of us have the testimony of coming up out of this and can testify to the truth of this passage so anyone who wants to share their testimony with alcoholism please share in the comments below Revelation chapter 12 verse 11 says and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony so your testimony is very important. Don't hold that to yourself. Don't love your life so much that you allow shame to keep you from sharing the truth. Share your testimony and help your brothers and sisters to be overcomers. So we see here that Setuel, a fallen watcher, is the one who teaches to make these strong drinks and leads people down the path of insecurity. Remember, it was the insecurity of the devil that caused him to boast of himself. Insecurity leads to pride. It says that this dirty fallen watcher is 
the enemy of marriages. And most of us have seen it. Most of us have had so much trauma in our lives that we grew up seeing that. Maybe even excusing it, thinking that it's normal for a man to toss back a cold one. So the question remains, why are so many people still holding on to the alcohol, to alcoholism? You see, there are many excuses that people make so they can keep dealing with this. But after today, after today, if you're watching this lesson, you won't be able to say that nobody showed you, that nobody taught you what the truth is. We are gonna pull the skirt off set wheel today. We are gonna expose all the dirty draws. You see people, people wanna say that it is okay to drink wine because the Messiah drank wine. And that is a fair argument because we can all go into the Bible and we can read where the Messiah was drinking wine. However, there is no excuse for a lack of diligence. So we're going to do our diligence today. Let's go into the book of Psalms. Let's go to Psalm chapter 84 and let's read verses 5 through 7. That's Psalm 84 verses 5 through 7. It says, Blessed is the man whose strength is in thee, in whose heart are the ways of them, who passing through the valley of Baca make it a well. The rain also filleth the pools. They go from strength to strength. Every one of them in Zion appeareth before God. Isn't that beautiful? It says, Blessed is the man whose strength is in thee. Man, verse 6 says, Who passing through the valley of Baca. That word Baca, it means weeping. Who passing through the valley of weeping, make it a well. The rain also filleth the pools. So now we're getting a visual, we're getting a visual of rain, of pure, beautiful water, of blessings from the Father. How many of you know that when you are blessed, you go from strength to strength? <laughs> Not from struggle to strength to struggle to strength to struggle to strength, but you go from strength to strength. It says they go from strength to strength. Every one of them in Zion appeareth before God. Oh, so now it's being tied to Zion. Isn't that beautiful? Let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 5 and let's read verse 23. The second Samuel chapter five, verse 23. It says, and when David inquired of the Lord, he said, thou shalt not go up, but fetch a compass behind them and come upon them over against the mulberry trees. Now look at that. It says, but fetch a compass. That word compass means to surround. It's not saying go get a compass so you know which way to go. It's saying surround them. Now let's go to Genesis chapter 29. And let's read verse 11. That's the book of Genesis chapter 29 verse 11. It says, And Jacob kissed Rachel and lifted up his voice and wept. Jacob wept. Let's look at that word wept in the Strong's. That word for wept in the Strong's is 1058 in the Hebrew. So it's H1058. That word is baka. It means to weep, generally to bemoan with tears. So the word baka means to weep. Didn't we just read that word, Baca? Let's go back to Psalm 84 and let's read verse 6 again. Psalm 84 verse 6, it says, Who passing through the valley of Baca, 
make it a well. The rain also filleth the pools. Oh, so who passing through the valley of weeping. This is talking about the valley of weeping. But this time in your strongs, that word Baca, it is not 1058. This time it is 1056. It says Baca, a place in Palestine. And then it says weeping, a valley in Palestine. So now we are seeing the correlation between Baca, the valley of weeping, and then where in Genesis chapter 29, verse 11, it said that Jacob wept. But the word Baca is being used in both places. So now we have looked in the Strong's at H 1058, and we've looked at H 1056. Now let's go back to 2 Samuel chapter 5. Verse 23. That's Second Samuel chapter 5, verse 23. It says, And when David inquired of the Lord, he said, Thou shalt not go up, but fetch a compass behind them, and come upon them over against the mulberry trees. Somebody said, What? What does any of this have to do with alcoholism? Hold on, we're getting there. Be patient. Let's look at what the Strong says for the mulberry trees. It says H1057 Baca. Now we're seeing Baca again. Three times Baca. This time it says the weeping tree, the gum distilling tree, perhaps the mulberry tree. It says a shrub which drips sap when it is cut. So now we see that the valley of weeping was a valley that was filled with mulberry trees. But how many of you know that it was not just speaking of a physical valley? I have told y'all, the Holy Spirit teaches things precept upon precept. Understand that that wisdom, that knowledge, it is manifold. But don't take my word for it. Open up your Apocryphas and go to Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 7. Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 7, verse 22. Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 7, verse 22. It says, For wisdom, which is the worker of all things, taught me. For in her is an understanding spirit, holy, one only, manifold, subtle, lively, clear, undefiled, plain, not subject to hurt, loving the thing that is good, quick, which cannot be let it, ready to do good. You see, there is more to Psalm 84 than meets the eye. You see, these precepts, <laughs> they are manifold. Let's go into the book of Matthew chapter 5, and let's read verses 1 through 11. That's the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. It says, And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. What? I know y'all have read that before, but what? There's so much power in those words, I can barely stand it. 
Now for the sake of this lesson, let's just point out a few of these. It says, blessed are the poor in spirit. It says, blessed are they that mourn. How many of y'all know what mourning is? Mourning is lamenting, is bewailing. It is crying. It is weeping. Let's continue. It says, blessed are the meek. Isn't that something? Oh, and look at this. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Wow, they shall be filled. What did we just read in Psalm 84 verse 6? It says, Who passing through the valley of Baca, that's the valley of weeping, make it a well. The rain also filleth the pools. <laughs> So, who is it that is being filled right here? Is it the high? Is it the mighty? Is it the proud? Or is it the poor in spirit? Is it those that mourn? Is it the meek? Is it them that hunger and thirst after righteousness? You see, everybody wants to build a Zion. Everybody wants to go to Zion. Everybody wants to claim that they are Zion. But to be a citizen of Zion, to be a citizen of Ma'in, there are prerequisites. You see, the bar was set. And unless you are hearing, unless you have ears to hear, then you don't even know what the qualifications are. But those qualifications are all over the scriptures. To him that hath ears, let him hear. Now let's go to the book of James, chapter 4. And let's read verses 8 through 10. That's the book of James, chapter 4, verses 8 through 10. As a matter of fact, let's start at verse 7. James, chapter 4, verses 7 through 10. That's James, chapter 4, verses 7 through 10. It says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Nigh means close. Keep reading. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Uh-oh. Now we're getting somewhere. Look what this is saying. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. But who is it telling to weep? It says, cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. This is letting you know that you need to weep for your sins. How many of you guys know that when you cry, when tears come from your eyes, that is a type of baptism. So understand that if you are in a situation where you cannot reach the water to be fully submerged, that's okay. If you cry out to the Most High with your heart and you repent, and those tears start to fall, the Most High will use that. That's not to say if you've had a good cry, you don't need to go get dipped in the water, but understand that if circumstances restrict you, if you're in the prison house and you can't make your way to the water to be submerged, those tears will suffice. What we are seeing here in James is that we should be weeping for our sins. Now, let's go to Psalm 107 and let's read verses 35 through 43. That's Psalm 107, verses 35 through 43. That's Psalm 107, verses 35 through 43. It says, He turneth the wilderness into a standing water and dry ground into water springs. And there he maketh the hungry to dwell, 
that they may prepare a city for habitation, and sow fields, and plant vineyards, which may yield fruits of increase. He blesses them also, so that they are multiplied greatly, and suffereth not their cattle to decrease. Again, they are menaced and brought low through oppression, affliction, and sorrow. He poureth contempt upon princes, and causeth them to wander in the wilderness, where there is no way. Yet setteth he the poor on high from affliction, and maketh him families like a flock. The righteous shall see it, and rejoice, and all iniquity shall stop her mouth. Whoso is wise and will observe these things, even they shall understand the loving kindness of the Lord. And yes, that word, loving kindness, again, it is kased, just like Anoki said in the Strongs. So now you're understanding the importance of going through this valley, this valley of weeping. Because you go through this valley, and then what happens? What happens is, you are filled. Look what it says. It says, and there he maketh the hungry to dwell. Didn't we just read in Matthew chapter 5, verse 6? It says, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. So in Psalm 107, where it says, he maketh the hungry to dwell, that they may prepare a city for habitation. What is this talking about? Oh, <laughs> this is talking about Zion. This is talking about establishing a righteous community. But look what it says. Again, they are menaced and brought low through oppression, affliction, and sorrow. What does brought low mean? It means to be made humble. This is why you have to understand that when you are going through, you need to continue to praise the Father. Understand that the Father is forging you in fire. But once again, do not take my word for it. Let's go to Ecclesiasticus or Sirach chapter 2 in your Apocrypha. That's Ecclesiasticus or Sirach chapter 2. And let's read verses 4 and 5. It says... Whatsoever is brought upon thee, take cheerfully, and be patient when thou art changed to a low estate. For gold is tried in the fire, and acceptable men in the furnace of adversity. And if you still don't believe me, let's get another precept. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, that's in your Old Testament. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 4. It says, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance. Understand that this is something that has its appointed time. We are supposed to enter into that valley. We are supposed to weep for our sins. Let's go back to Psalm 107, and let's read verse 43 again. That Psalm 107 verse 43. It says, Whoso is wise and will observe these things, even they shall understand the loving kindness of the Lord. Are y'all hearing me? Do you understand that all of this leads right back to his loving kindness? These are passages that you should be taking heed to. Everyone is not going to hearken to these words. Go to Proverbs chapter 24 verse 7. Proverbs chapter 24, verse 7. Wisdom is too high for a fool. He openeth not his mouth in the gate. So if you don't want to be a fool, then open your ears and take heed. Somebody say it again. What does this have to do with alcohol? <laughs> all right, all right, let's get to it. Let's go to the book of Matthew, chapter 26. We're going to go to the book of Matthew chapter 26 and let's read verses 27 through 29. It says, and he took the cup and he gave thanks and he gave it to them saying, drink ye all of it for this is my blood of the New Testament, 
which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. What did Messiah mean by that? Let's go to Luke chapter 5 and let's read verses Let's read verses 37 through 39. Luke chapter 5 verses 37 through 39. It says, And no man putteth new wine into old bottles, else the new wine will burst the bottles and be spilled, and the bottles shall perish. But new wine must be put into new bottles, and both are preserved. No man also having drunk old wine straightway desireth new, for he saith, The old is better. Why do you think a man who's been drinking old wine, why do you think that man would not want new wine? And why do you think it is that you don't put new wine into old bottles? Ladies and gentlemen, new wine is juice. If you put juice into an old container where the juice has started to ferment, then that's not fresh juice. You're going to ruin that new juice. But someone who has been drinking that old juice, they have been dealing with with set a well. You see, if they have been drinking alcohol, they ain't thinking about no juice. Let me tell you something. Them brothers standing outside of the liquor store, down on the corner, you know where it's at. Those brothers standing out there who are drinking, who are drinking to the point that every day there's a drive-by or something up in there. Bullets getting shot up all the time up in there and they just standing out there drinking like their life is in no danger. Them brothers who are drinking that, they ain't thinking about no juice. They ain't thinking about no Kool-Aid. They don't want no Sunny D. They don't want no Capri Sun. None of that. All they got on their mind is that whiskey, is that wine, is that beer. This is why the scriptures warn against drunkenness. Let's go to Luke chapter 21 and read verse 34. Luke 21, verse 34. It says, And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life, and so that day come upon you unawares. Do y'all need a stronger, a stronger example than that? Let's go to Galatians chapter 5, and let's read verse 21. Galatians chapter 5, verse 21. It says, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But people want to play with that. People want to think that it's okay for them to drink as long as they don't get drunk. They say, well, Messiah was drinking, we should follow his example. But I ask you the question, was he? Let's go back to Matthew chapter 26 and let's read verse 29 again. Matthew 26 verse 29. He says, but I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. Oh, so... The Messiah says he's going to drink new wine in the kingdom. And what is new wine? Juice. Now, understand what was going on here. This was the Last Supper. Messiah came talking about drinking the fruit of the vine, which is juice. Don't you know what happens if you go get a fruit and you squeeze it? Juice comes out. But he came doing that. So he could be an example. And we all know that we should be what? Christ-like. But don't take my word for it. Let's go to Acts chapter 10. 
and let's read verse 41. That's Acts chapter 10, verse 41. As a matter of fact, let's go ahead and read verse 40. Let's start at verse 40. Let's read 40 and 41. It says, Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. What? Let's read 42 and 43 as well. 42. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of quick and dead. To him give all the prophets witness and through his name whatsoever believeth Salakia, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Are y'all understanding that he wasn't playing? He came and he showed you an example. Then he even told you, this is what you do. He came with straight juice and said, do this. Don't believe me? Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and read verse 25. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 25. It says, After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. Do does not mean this uh, you can do if you feel like it. No, that's a commandment. He's saying this, this is a thing that you do. That's a command sentence, has a period at the end of it. So understand that new wine is juice. Now, let's go into the book of remembrance of First Chi. And let's go to chapter 7 and let's read verse 72. That's First Chi, chapter 7, verse 72 in the book of remembrance. It says, And it came to pass that after John had gone before the face of Messiah for the space of two years and his example had been set. This is talking about John the Baptist setting an example. Let's keep reading. And all was in readiness. Messiah went forth to follow after him. And Messiah prepared water that it turned into new bacca wine. And thus he gave of the fruit of his labors also unto the people among the wicked as did John. And Messiah was diligent to follow the example of John in all things. And he used to say, Why should I minister before the face of the church, seeing they keep the law and love repentance? Am I not therefore sent to minister unto those in Israel who sin and love not the law and the prophets, even as John does minister? And he thrust himself into his ministry among the wicked, and he loved with great power those who sinned. And he would go unto the temple often, where, he, where the wicked gathered, to teach them repentance and the things of the kingdom, and demonstrate unto them all things whatsoever the Father said unto him. And the method of John in using discretion with the truth was to use parables, even so did Messiah follow his example. So look what it says here. It says Messiah prepared water that it turned into new Bacca wine. To new mulberry juice. <laughs> but pay attention to this. We see here that he went among the wicked. And it says that he loved with great power. Why do you think Messiah prepared water so that it turned into bacca wine? He could have picked any kind of juice, but he chose mulberry juice. We're going to see in a few minutes. For now, stay in the book of remembrance of First to Chi, and let's go to chapter 10, and let's read verses 86 and 87. That's 1 Chi chapter 10, verses 86 and 87. 
it says, And there was no one to meet him as he arose from the tomb. And there came only a woman to look after the care of his dead body. And the Lord arose, and after speaking to the woman, went straight away to see his mother. And Mary had the coals of fire in the middle of the floor, which a flat stone, with a flat stone upon them, and she was kneading bread. And as she sat there, a shadow from the doorway crossed over her, and she looked, and behold, it was her son, and his hair was long again, as it was before the death of John. And he said, Mother, and she gasped and said, Oh, you live. And she sat there after a moment, Salakia, and she sat there, and after a moment she said, Then we shall all, Salakia, then we all shall live. And she began to brush the dust from her clothes. And the Lord took a cloth, and he dampened it with water, and he wiped her face clean. And he sat down before her on the other side of the fire. And Mary put the bread upon the stone, and took a cloth, and picked up a pot heating by the fire. And she put it upon the stone covering the bread. And they spoke to one another quietly, with great feelings of respect. And they reminisced concerning his childhood. And life came back into Mary. And she laughed with him about that which transpired upon the staircase. And when the bread was done, he took it and he broke it. And taking it, he said, Take and eat of this bread, mother, for it is the element of righteousness to declare that you shall never be alone. For I am with you in the midst of all things. And my love is always with you in the midst of the Urkadeshi. And he, taking back a wine from a shelf near him, served her and said, Take this wine, mother, and drink it, for it is the element of righteousness to declare that I have been obedient in all things in my love for my Father in heaven, and use it to show forth that the joy of forgiveness overshadows all the pains and sufferings that are to be endured so that you might not dwell upon them in your heart. What? Did y'all just read that? So, Messiah served his mother communion. And look what it says. He used baca wine. So again, we're seeing that he used the mulberry wine. But now look at this. So he served his mother mulberry juice. And then look what it says. It says, For it is the element of righteousness to declare that I have been obedient in all things in my love for my Father in heaven. And use it to show forth that the joy of forgiveness overshadows all the pains and sufferings that are to be endured. So, again, we're seeing an overwhelming example of loving kindness. And what did we read in Psalm 107 verse 43? Whoso is wise and will observe these things, even they shall understand the loving kindness of the Lord. And all of this goes right back to what? Psalm 84 verse 6, who passing through the valley of Baca or the valley of weeping, make it a well. The rain also filleth the pools. They go from strength to strength. Every one of them in Zion appeareth before God. And then we go into the book of remembrance and we see, we see where Messiah is serving his mother communion using mulberry juice, using Back of wine as his blood. And what did he say? It is the element of righteousness to declare that I have been obedient in all things in my love for my Father in heaven 
and use it to show forth that the joy of forgiveness overshadows all the pain and sufferings that are to be endured so that you might not dwell upon them in your heart? What? And did we not read in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 that there is a time to weep? But you see, you pass through that valley of Baca, that valley of weeping. You don't stay in the valley. You don't dwell in the valley. You pass through the valley. And after that, you move from strength to strength. And Messiah says this is the element of righteousness to declare. What? <laughs> you see, all around the mulberry bush, the monkey chased the weasel. You see, that monkey was playing a game, but that weasel wasn't playing a game. That weasel understood that my time in this valley, my time with all of this weeping, this is temporary. I'm here today, but I'm gone tomorrow. Now let's talk about the righteous definition of the mulberry tree. The mulberry tree feels to weep for your sins. So understand that the Messiah, he wasn't using that particular example just on a whim. Oh no. He was on purpose selecting the back of wine or the mulberry juice because of its creative purpose and because of his creative purpose. Again, the mulberry tree feels to weep for your sins. And it's all about forgiveness. Let's go to Acts chapter 13. That's the book of Acts chapter 13. And let's read verses 37 and 38. Acts chapter 13 verses 37 and 38. It says, But he whom God raised again saw no corruption. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 1 and let's read verses 7 through 12. That's Ephesians chapter 1 verses 7 through 12. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded towards us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he has purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. In whom, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ. Did y'all just read that? It all goes back to his created purpose. And all of this was prophesied to be understood and coming out in the dispensation of the fullness of times. And family, I have one more scripture for you. One more proverb, if you will. We're going to go into the, pseudepig the pseudepigrapha, or the pseudepigrapha, however you pronounce it. We're going to go into the pseudepigrapha, or the pseudepigrapha, of the Old Testament and we're gonna go we're gonna go into the R.H. Charles version and we're gonna go to the story of Ahikar chapter 2 we're gonna go into the story of Ahikar chapter 2 and we're gonna read verse 7 that's Ahikar chapter 2 verse 7 again this is found in the pseudepigrapha of the Old Testament edited and introduced by R.H. Charles. Actually, it's going to be volume two. All right. Ahikar chapter two, verse seven. It says, My son, be not in a hurry like the almond tree, whose blossom is the first to appear, 
but whose fruit is the last to be eaten. But be equal and sensible like the mulberry tree, whose blossom is the last to appear, but whose fruit is the first to be eaten. You see that, family? Be like the mulberry tree. Go through that season of weeping. Weep for your sins. We just went through a bunch of scriptures, a whole bunch of precepts that let you know that there is a time for weeping. And it is a beautiful thing. But go through that season so you can make sure that you're bearing good fruit. Now, I know I said that was the last scripture, but I got another one. Let's go to Matthew chapter 3 and let's read verses 9 and 10. That's Matthew chapter 3 verses 9 and 10. It says, And think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you, That God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't care how pure your blood is. I don't care if you can trace yourself back to the very room in the farm of Jacob himself. You being an Israelite is not enough. So don't think and say to yourself that we have Abraham to our father or we have Jacob to our father. Because if your fruit is not good, you will be cast into the fire. Family, I pray that y'all were edified. I pray that y'all had ears to hear. Remember, I love each and every one of you. The water, Kai. All praises to Anoki said, Bahashem Matza, the Lamb. This is little son Sabal saying, Much love and much shalom. Thank you.